Hello vinyl community and fellow Beatle maniacs and uh, welcome to my review of the Beatles 50th anniversary releases of the White Album. Um, so since the unboxing on Friday I've spent um, a considerable amount of the weekend and um, yesterday with this set and um, yeah I think I've digested it enough to give you my initial thoughts on it. Um, and I've, I've watched quite a few um, review videos over the weekend um, from fellow members of the vinyl community which I've really enjoyed. So yeah, here are, here are my uh, opinions for what they're worth. Um, so, uh, I, I, if I start with the remix itself, it's obviously very very different to last year's Pepper remix in the sense that Giles Martin said they were aiming to replicate the feel of the mono mix in Sgt. Pepper. Um, but give it a proper stereo mix for the first time, but using the mono as the basis. And that was very, very successful for me. With the White Album, they were not uh, aiming for a mono uh, as the bass at all. Because um, I think the, the most... Um, people are most familiar with the stereo for the White Album by far and there's nothing essentially wrong with either of the two mixes of the white original mixes of the White Album but the stereo is, is fantastic and it, and it is my go-to. Um, and I guess the question is will this new remix replace the original mix or be, become my go-to if you like and the answer to that is um, possibly yeah, I think it's very, very successful. I think they've done a great job. Um, and um, just to sort of finish off the thread that I was talking about, while Giles and his team were replicating mono for, for Pepper, they were absolutely wanting to uh, aim for stereo with the White Album um, and bring their own feel to it because Pepper is famously um, bounced down quite a lot. There are many, many tracks that were copied to one track and that was copied to one track so they could overdub and overdub and overdub. Whereas with the White Album, as is evident with this set, there are far many more band performances and fewer overdubs. Um, and then later on in the sessions they had access to 8-track for the first time. So um, the yeah, the feel of the original mix is, is great and there's lots and lots of space in it. So what they have aimed to do with this, if it's my understanding, is that they're presenting it in a new way, giving it a new feel, possibly bringing certain elements more to the fore, and but while maintaining that kind of gritty, sometimes unsettling feel that the album has, because you can't make this too clean. It's It wouldn't be the White Album anymore. And I think on the whole, they've succeeded in doing that. So I'll just very quickly run through, I'm not going to do every track, but I'm going to run through um, certain tracks that jumped out at me as I was listening. So, um, Back in the USSR was a was a pre-release track, so I've had plenty of time to, um, to get to that. I think they did that really, really well. Um, there's, there's lots of oomph to it. Paul's drums are really up front, which is great. Um, but, yeah, the first one proper um, that that jumped out at me was Dear Prudence, which has always been a favourite of mine. Um, just the clarity of everything, particularly John's vocals, are so present. Um, and yeah, you feel like we could all be Prudence. He's talking directly to us. It's it, it's amazing. Um, such a, a phenomenal band performance anyway. Um, everything just seems the clarity of everything just it just we just seem to have um all the different elements of the song um just have fresh light shone upon them for me um that ending with those incredible drum breaks um yeah that that, that sort of um, octave bass part boom, 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 boom. yeah um apologize for that uh, straight into Glass Onion which seems to have a lot more oomph uh, I've always loved the string arrangement on that um, both within the song and also the sort of creepy little coda that, um, that, that always unnerved me as a kid um, so that that's phenomenal um, 
there's been a, a, a little bit of, um, I don't know if controversy is the right word, but I, I think I, I've heard quite a few people have issues with the Why My Guitar Gently Weeps mix. Um, there was a uh, YouTube streaming event uh, last week and one of the questions to Giles Martin was which track was the hardest to mix. And uh, without hesitation, I think he said, Wow, my guitar gently weeps. I think he said he'd done three mixes of that. Um, and it, yeah, it's strange. It, it, there's lots that I like about it. Um, I do like, you can hear the, seem to hear the acoustic guitar a lot more cleanly. Uh, and George's voice is front and center. However, um, I was watching me and Mr. Mayo's video yesterday and um, I, I think I probably agree with him about the song being about a guitar and the fact you've got Eric Clapton on there giving a phenomenal performance. Uh, yeah, that seems to have been taken back in the mix a little bit. So, yeah, it, that, that just seems a, an odd choice, perhaps. Um, so th that wasn't um, an um, incredible success. It, it, it's good, but I think the original album will probably still be my go-to there. Um, moving on to the next one, Happiness is a Warm Gun. Um, has always been one of my favourite Beatles songs and this new version does not disappoint. Um, at the end, I noticed, I think I noticed the remix more at the end when you get into the sort of, um, yeah, is it a doo-wop section? The, the, the happiness is a warm gun section. Um, so much oomph to it. Love the, the bang, bang, shoot, shoot, backing vocals. Um, John's spoken bit. Um, I think that's that's a really great remix. Um, Blackbird, um, Paul just feels really, really present and in the room. Um, I mean, how do you improve Blackbird? It's, it, it is what it is, but it just felt even closer. Why don't we do it in the road? Um, I've, I've put a tick next to that one because that has for years and years been a bit of a throwaway track and it, it, it's a bit of fun it's great i never skip it or anything but um it, it's just a, a track that's there what a great performance that is um R ringo's drums just seem to kick a little bit more and paul's vocal wow um if there was a better rock and roll singer on the planet in uh, 1968 i would love to know who it is because that guy who can go from Blackbird to Rocky Raccoon to Why Don't We Do It In The Road to I Will, Helter Skelter. In the same album, it's just in, it's just absolutely incredible. Um, so that jumped out at me, whatever reason. Uh, for similar reasons to Blackbird, Julia, the remix of Julia, just um, even makes it even more touching in a way. Year Blues is probably, arguably the biggest success for me. Um, it was a very muddy production, uh, which worked. I mean, you know, it, it added to to the song and the message, but it, it's it's just it's a very very clever reimagining of that one. There's, there seems to be um, quite a fair amount of reverb on the voice, and yeah, it's just a fantastic band performance. Ditto, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. Um, those guys could play. Put those four in a room together and they could really, really play. And that's another example of it. Um, one of my favourite songs on the White Album is Long, Long, Long. And it always was. I've, uh, it's sort of unsung, very underrated, lovely little performance. And George, again, added to the mood of the song, but he was always very far back in the mix. And it had a sort of creepy quality to it. Um, but George is, again, a lot more present. And again, I don't know if it replaces the original mix to me, but I like what they did with that. Um, and it just it just shines a bit more of a light on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are the ones that spring to mind from the, from the new 2018 remix. Um, I like it. Um, I think he's done a great job. Um, there are certain tracks that... Um, I think possibly could have been done better, but on the whole, it's a new way of looking at something very, very familiar. And we've always got the original mixes, so 
nothing to complain about there. Moving on to the Isha demos, which is CD3 and uh, discs three and four on the on the vinyl. Um, worth the price of admission. I have had a very, very dodgy bootleg version of the Isha demos for years and years and years. And I listened to it once and I was like, mm, well, I've heard them. Um, yeah, they're great, whatever. But these, the clarity of these recordings, oh, it, it was it, it was strange because I, I listened to discs one and two and I was like, oh, great, I've heard the remix. So that's what I was most excited about. But as soon as I stuck on the Isha demos, I was like, well, okay, well, this is it. This is <laughs> this, this is why I've handed my money over. Um, I don't particularly want to single out any particular tracks on the Isha demos because they, they are what they are. They are demos, but wow, they, they've just presented them in a way that they are so um, easy to latch onto now. They haven't got that distance about them. Um, so yeah, I, 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 find, I find it wonderful that we have this. And the fact the Beatles never demoed, well, they did, but they, they didn't demo a whole album in the same way before or after. So it's, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a superb thing to have. Nice to hear um, things like Sour Milk Sea and Circles yeah, with such clarity. Um, I always liked um, the Isha demo of the uh, Bungalow Bill. Because I don't think John's not quite sure what he's doing rhythmically. He sort of drops a five four bar in there, um, and kind of throws off throws people off a little bit. Not knowing that they drop that for the recording eventually, but I quite like the quirkiness of that. Um, so yeah, the Isha demos. If you have just got the uh, remix on its own. Um, Try and seek out the Isha demos because they are well worth listening to. Moving on to the uh, discs four, five, and six on the Super Deluxe, which are the sessions. Um, I adore um, outtakes, always have. And um, when the anthologies came out in the nineties, it just it felt like Christmas every time you got something new. And the first thing I'm going to say is that. Uh, regarding Anthology 3, which the whole of Disc 1 of Anthology 3 was the White Album Sessions, um, there are yeah there are one or two um, crossovers, but on the whole, um, Apple have chosen different takes, uh, or extended takes, so we haven't got too much repetition, which, which I'm pleased about. Um, so yeah, I've um I've just I've highlighted um, a few tracks across the session CDs which I'll just talk about briefly. Um so yeah, in 2009 um a bootleg appeared on the internet uh, which was Revolution Take 20 uh, which Revolution 1 um and the after the fade out of the track on the album it went on for a further 6 minutes um with um weird and wild collection of overdubs and backing vocals and things like that um, and that that is out there if you know where to look um, but it's not on this set uh, and again some people were a bit disappointed because it's kind of iconic and became the sort of foundation of Revolution 9 but what we have I think is probably even more interesting because it's the basis of that track we got take 18 of Revolution 1 which again goes on for nearly 11 minutes and it's superb. I mean, again, these have all been remixed, so it's amazing clarity. Um, so yeah, you've got, you've got the sort of, you've got the, the, the basic vocal of Revolution 1, but you haven't got the Shooby Doo Ops, you haven't got that weird sort of wailing guitar sound, I think it is. Um, and you haven't got the back in um, Mama. Da, da. all that stuff um, but you hear so many more things and you, particularly you hear John absolutely screaming his throat out on the all right um, which you do here in Revolution 9 uh, but yeah the big thing for me um, uh, John, after John's probably worn his voice out he, he says right I've had enough and then the track goes on for a further minute and a half maybe and then Paul 
takes over and starts singing Love Me Do. Who knew? Um, I don't remember reading that in Mark Lewison's recording sessions, and I don't think I, s I read it anywhere else. So that was that was big. That was really big, um, and that was great that that happened. Um, a track a lot of people have talked about already. I've seen it on reviews. Is the uh, Taste Take Ten of Good Night with the guitar from Take Five? Um, didn't know that had happened either. Um, so we've got a double track Ringo vocal with Beatle harmonies with those guys it uh, it's not the cleanest harmony you know you're not going to get because or this boy but what you get is you get a really sweet alternative to the very lush orchestral thing you get on the final album and it's so it's so nice and it kind of just transports me into in, into that studio where they're you know helping their drummer out on that song and it's uh, that's lovely um, I quite like instrumental backing tracks. I've not highlighted them all, but um, the one of the fast version of Revolution, I really like that. Um, it's not a straight version. There's some drum fills missing. There's bits and pieces missing. It's a bit rough here and there. Um, but yeah, you hear that dirty guitar and um, yeah, that, so that's that's really fun. Um, I think another thing that came out of this session that I don't know if they uncovered a lot of um, rehearsal takes that had been previously unknown, but um, next one I've highlighted is Cry Baby Cry, uh, which I don't know if you've seen my t-shirt. Reminded me very much of Pink Floyd. You've got a very Dave Gilmore sort of guitar feel to it. You've got an organ. Um, it's a bit more chilled. It's got a Dark Side of the Moon sort of feel to it. Um, pre-Dark Side of the Moon, of course. Um, yeah, very different to what we eventually got. But um, yeah, that was a that was that was a revelation. Um, we had um, another of the pre-release tracks, "While My Guitar Gently Weeps," uh, with Paul on organ. So it was kind of the acoustic version we'd already had. The second take, though, uh, with Paul sort of noodling underneath not quite sure of the chords yet but there are thereabouts if they'd um, sort of perfected a version with the organ that would have been really really nice so I've highlighted that um, then later on on the same disc uh, George returns to While My Guitar Gently Weeps and we get a an outtake of the album version uh, with Clapton in the studio and that's that's superb um, you can hear them clawing towards it so the piano uh, bit the beginning isn't quite there, but Paul's working working towards it. Um, very um, a very um, close to the final um, version of the guitar solo, and then the track breaks down when George tries some sort of vocal gymnastics. And he said, "I think he says I tried a smoky, but I'm not smoky." <laughs> so um, that's great. Um, you're so square, baby, I don't care. I've highlighted that because that is um, it's just a, it's just a little jam. But when you compare it to the really messy, aimless jams of the Get Back sessions a few months later, that is tight and together and it rocks. Um, yeah, so they're having fun there. Um, and then we get a dirty version of Helter Skelter. Uh, which is real. Uh, the the um, it's take seventeen, so the second version of Helter Skelter, not the first one, which was a slog. <laughs> but yeah, the first the, the one on disc one that goes on for thirteen minutes is uh, it feels long, and I can totally see why they chopped it down to four minutes for Anthology Three, because it just keeps go plodding on e e e e e. Oh dear. Um, it's great to listen to once, but I won't be listening to it a lot. And there is a 27 minute version out there, ladies and gentlemen. But um, apparently, according to Giles it's, and Mark Lewison, it's just like that one. So, yeah, I'm, I won't be clamouring for that. But certainly the second version is as hard rocking as they get. And, you know, I like to think, you know, Kurt Cobain was hearing that somehow, <laughs> age one. But yeah, it, it was very, very, very grungy. So I love that. Um, and then the final disc, 
we've got um, It Was Nice To Hear Can You Take Me Back, which has always been a highlight of the White Album, that little uh, joining section between Cry Baby Crime Revolution 9, you get the whole of that, um, so it's nice to hear. Um, the Outtake of Happiness is a Warm Gun, because I hold that song uh, in such high esteem, it's great to hear um, them have a go at it, and how unusual it is, and rhythmically all over the place it is but it just works and John at the end says well I think we're getting closer and so <laughs> lovely little banter uh, studio banter which is great um, and then finally I've highlighted Julia uh, which a lot of people have talked about but yeah that that is the famous um, well, I don't say it's famous but it's, um, <laughs> it's something they talked about pre-release where this was was these were two rehearsal takes of Julia that were um, previously undiscovered they were at the end of a tape and it's John trying it out uh, and he start in there's a lovely little discussion with George Martin in in the control room and then he starts strumming it and then he eventually picks it uh, which is um, of course what we know and love but it just sounds so fragile and hearing him clawing towards that final version is so wonderful um just a, a couple of points um of things that um maybe i i wasn't crazy about or perhaps i thought could have done more um yeah they seem to have got a sort of a halfway house on this one because obviously it's the white album but at the end of the sessions disc we have the inner light lady madonna and across the universe which of course are pre uh, India. So, which suggests to me they're thinking this is a 1968 uh, collection. Uh, but if it is a 1968 collection, we should probably have um, final versions of um, the Inner Light remixed, Hey Bulldog remixed, um, the single version of Lady Madonna, and definitely Hey Jude and Revolution. Um, uh, but yeah they were left off uh, which I find um, a strange decision particularly the Hey Jude Revolution because even though Hey Jude was uh, remixed for the one release uh, the single version of Revolution hasn't been and I would love to have heard that uh, so yeah just I would question why those are there but if they are there we should have it possibly should have everything um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I am so thankful with what we got, but yeah, these, these are just things I have to ask. Um, it's a shame that the things recorded at Trident Studios, uh, we don't have the full session tapes for those, so you just get backing tracks. I understand some people aren't keen on those sort of instrumental tracks. But of those instrumental tracks, Honey Pie, I think, is the most interesting because you hear George Martin's um, arrangement, which obviously always amazing, but it's great to hear those up front. Um, so yeah, so that's a shame, but of course we can do nothing about that. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, um, thinking of the Blu-ray in this set, which I've not really uh, had a chance to fully explore, it's a shame that we didn't get any visual stuff to go with the audio. Um, a few things spring to mind. There were, um, promotional Apple films. There's, there's one of Paul playing Blackbird in the studio and there's one of George Martin and John having a conversation. I've seen clips on YouTube of Paul doing an acoustic Helter Skelter there as well. Would have been nice to hear that. Um, there is some behind the scenes, um, there's a film crew that went into Abbey Road while they were making, uh, while they were doing Hey Jude, I think. That's on the anthology. And again, could have been on there. That would have been nice. Um, We've had the Hey Juden Revolution stuff off the David Frost show before. Um, so, but you know, they put um, a Day in the Life promo on uh, Pepper and that was on the One Plus as well. So, yeah, I, I just think that there could have been one or two extra things. There's, of course, all that uh, Pathé News uh, footage of the Beatles in India. Perhaps would have been nice to see that. But... I'm quibbling a little bit here. Um, what we do have, uh, and I've not 
fully I've not read it all yet, but we have a brilliant book. I love I love the book in the middle of this. They've um they've pulled out all the stops on that, some great little essays, the track by track's fascinating. I'm just working my way through that now. Um I love the scrapbook of lyrics in the middle. Um so yeah, it, it's a set that's definitely been made with love and I'm very, very fond of it. Um so yeah, I've I've got to give it a ten. It's a ten. It's it's the Bloody Beatles White Album, isn't it? What do you mean? It was great. It's sold. It's the Bloody Beatles White Album. Mm. Shut up. And it's nice to look at it under a little bit of a microscope and um, appreciate the fact that those guys were here and gave us so much. So, uh, yeah, um, I have rambled on for a bit, so I will leave it there. Um, I hope you have uh, enjoyed the video. Please... Uh, please like and comment below and subscribe for more i'm hoping to um stick around a bit longer this time um to to make a few more videos for everybody and uh, i will see you very very soon thank you for watching and bye bye